Protagonist. This is the show of two people that I have worked with a lot and esteem highly, that's Fong and Francesca. And they, I hope, will speak up at some point during the proceedings. Uh, some of the panelists I've met, some of them I have not met, uh, some of them I know of, some of them I do not know of. Uh, so I will try simply to manage traffic uh, and to keep the conversation going. The format will be very, very simple. Uh, that each one of the artists or speakers or speakers will present something for about five to ten minutes. And then when that's all done, I will try and stir the pot. Um, let me say that the phrase that is the title of this show comes from the artist immediately to the left of me. Uh, and if indeed artists must make things in order to, to uh, uh, respond or keep up with the things that society does to destroy, uh, the pace of the destruction is staggering, which means that artists must do a lot and fast. And, of course, being artists, they don't do things on command in general. <laughs> they have to think outside the box, inside the box, all around the box, in order to think of ways to respond that are effective and also within their range. One of the, the greatest uh, mistakes that artists can make is to try to do work that talks about something rather than comes from an internal understanding of what the complexities really are. And that we owe it to artists to shed light on all the resistances, on all of the points of misunderstanding, as well as all of the particular things that they grasp and feel that they can promote or put forward as explanation or commentary. So I understand the political dimension of this, not so much as protest or as uh, manifesto-driven stuff, but rather an attempt to understand the problem the magnitude of which is truly almost beyond comprehension. And I think that uh, people will probably be saying some of those things. I will just say that for myself, and that's the end of my contribution. Okay? Um, but be that as it may, also one last thing. Uh, there is often the division between art and culture, between culture and nature. Um, this is the point where nature and culture meet. But meet, uh, as is the case, on nature's terms. Because nature, there's a phrase that was in the subway in New York that says, uh, I think it comes from Jung, uh, we cannot uh, yield to nature, but neither can we let her lose. And that's really what it's all about. We cannot be dictated to by nature, but neither can we let her lose. So now she is protesting very loudly to much that we do. And so the question is, how do, was, does one, again, accommodate nature as a central part of culture? So with that as minor preamble, let me turn it over to Laura. Thank you so much for those uh, incredible words. <laughs> sitting in a window sill, sitting in a window sill in the late afternoon, in the late afternoon, light on water, light on water moving on the Grand Canal. On the Grand Canal, Canal Grande, meandering through Venice while a cool breeze dances like Vivaldi along the dazzling chop. The chop, the chop, 
the top bright of the muddy water. The muddy water are the many estuaries of the many rivers that feed this lagoon. These rivers are here too. Listen. Inside this church, high tide is coming. It's coming now. Look there, next door, and you will see the snowy Alps. The snowy Alps and the fertile soil of the edges of the Adriatic are also here in this church. And if you listen, you can hear her. You can hear the lagoon. Our little reveal in this church of the lagoon is like an Arcadian tunnel connecting us all, all the way to North Africa. Water that we experience here will flow out of the church, flow out of the church into the lagoon, and the lagoon will flow out into the Adriatic, pouring into the Ionian, joining the Aegean in the center of Mare Nostrum, our sea. And if you listen, you can hear this. You can hear the cow god Io jump from Europe to Asia. You can feel in our sea the wash of Africa, the wash of Asia, the wash of Europe. We are all in your cradle together. Our sea, Mare Nostrum, carries the pollen of Spanish lavender, Etruscan honeysuckle, Jerusalem sage, and Syrian frankincense. You are awash with fertile estuarial muck. And once beholden of your blue, your blue, then you are forever changed. Profondo blue. Happy Mother's Day. Sorry, having turned to my left, which is my natural inclination, I will now turn to my right. Thanks. Uh, as many of you know, this past Monday, the United Nations announced the findings of the largest survey ever undertaken on planet Earth. The survey shows that current extinction rates are at an unprecedented level in human history. And we do see over a million species go extinct in the next several decades if we do not change our habits and actions. At the end of the day, this is a grave moral and ethical issue. While we are not guilty, we are all responsible. 66 million years ago, a giant asteroid struck the planet, also known as the Cretaceous Paleogene Extinction Event. It killed 75% of all species on this planet. Today, we are that asteroid. It is our actions that are having a major impact on the planet and causing the loss of these species, which could possibly lead to our very own extinction. Our dumping of plastics and rubbish into the oceans, our burning of fossil fuels, which create greenhouse gases that trap heat in the atmosphere, our inability to understand that humans and organized human life evolved in a very rare, stable period of geological time known as the Holocene. All of these things are leading to our very own destruction. Today, we have entered into the Anthropocene, the human age. We have left the stability that made us who we are today. As we are seeing the Holocene be a period marked by chaos, disorder, suffering as the stability of the Earth's systems begin to completely unravel. Bob cyclones, mega typhoons, hurricanes, flooding, wildfires will continue to wreak havoc on our societies. As society refuses to take the ecological crisis seriously and things begin to break down all around us, such as the natural world, 
society as a whole. Artists will play an increasingly greater role in society as the social value of art becomes more urgent to communicate these great as existential issues. Today, people realize that art can be a positive force for seeking the truth, for making social and political change, and for helping us question our moral, ethical, and philosophical assumptions. Art is our great hope for the change we need because of its ability to open our minds to new possibilities. But that was the uh, just a little write up I was asked to, to present, which I think mean, was translated into Italian. I have a longer uh, talk, but I mean, should we, should I skip that? Maybe just keep moving? I think we probably so should keep, 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 keep it more fluid, yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, so you can go back and pick up things and pull them out. Sounds great. Okay. okay. okay thank you. Okay.
we can try to understand why the, the climate of our planet is changing. So why, as we have observed, observed in the past 150 years, the in particular the temperature of our planet is increasing, and so uh, why we are talking of uh, the global warming. And so we can use uh, these models to investigate uh, the global warming, and in particular to try to understand what are the mechanisms that uh, produce, can produce a change in the climate. We know that there are a number of natural mechanisms a number of natural factors that can perturb the climate of our planet, but now we know that there is also a new factor which is the human uh, activities on, uh, on our planet that can interfere with the, with the physics of uh, the Earth and uh, changing its, uh, its, uh, uh, its climate. And, uh, and this is, again, a matter of scale. Uh, in fact, in the past 150 years or so, human activities have reached a scale so large as to interfere with the physics of the climate system of our planet, changing the physical properties of our planet. So in order to test this hypothesis that the human activities are responsible for the climate change, we can use our computer, our simulation, our climate models to make simulation and uh, verify this hypothesis. And uh, this is uh, what has been done by a number of centers, like the center I'm uh, working uh, here in Italy. And uh, so these are a number of simulations. The yellow lines that you see here are a number of simulations that have been done by many different climate centers in the world, trying to reproduce the, uh, the behavior of the climate system, and in particular the warming trend in the past 100 years. And uh, as you can see, our models can reproduce reasonably well the long-term trend uh, of uh, the observed global warming. And uh, now we can also test, actually, uh, the hypothesis of the human influence on, on the climate system, uh, repeating the same simulations that we have done to simulate the, the behavior of the 20th century. Uh, so repeating the same simulations, but now removing the information about uh, the climate, the, the human, the anthropogenic uh, forcing on the climate system. And uh, if we do so, these are the blue curves, you see that uh, we don't manage to reproduce the observed trend that we have seen in the past decades. So this has been considered the, the proof, the, basically the, the smoking gun, that uh, human activities are responsible for the, for the climate change that we are observing, because we do not have other explanation uh, for this uh, uh, observed trend if we don't uh, consider the human activities. With the models, we can also make simulations and try to understand what happens in the future. And this is what we do when we do these climate change projections uh, to, to, to try to see how, or try to, um, uh, to, to understand how the climate can be in, in the coming decades according to different, uh, um, different uh, socio-political, socio-economical development and so different uh, human activities and human forces in the climate system. And uh, here you see there are different scenarios um, where the global warming that uh, we will have in our planet in the coming decades uh, can be as large as 1.5 degrees at the end of the century if we start immediately with strong and, and mitigation policies in order to reduce our, our impact on the climate system, or otherwise if we continue as we have done in the past decades or with the so-called uh, so business as usual scenario, we will end up with a global warming of more than five degrees at the end of this century with all the implications that this could have on uh, As a philosopher, I naturally speak for last. And I do apologize, but I'm going to speak in, in my language in Italian, so this will allow me to be more precise. I know that our fantastic interpreter has a text that I, I wrote for this occasion.
Io sono uno che ama imparare. La campagna e gli alberi non mi vogliono insegnare niente. Gli uomini della città invece sì. Queste parole, 25 secoli fa, furono messe in bocca a Socrate, il padre della razionalità occidentale, l'uomo che ha inaugurato il pensiero critico libero da dogmi, da pregiudizi. E fu Platone a mettergliele in bocca, a fargliele pronunciare all'inizio del Fedro, che è un'opera tra le più belle dell'antichità, magnifica e e paradossale, un capolavoro di scrittura concepito per criticare i limiti della scrittura. E ciò che più colpisce in questa frase, inserita quasi con nonchalance in una conversazione tra amici, è la presa di distanza dalla natura, altro che studiarla. Il disinteresse manifesto per ciò che sta fuori dallo spazio politico. Solo quest'ultimo, infatti, secondo Socrate, consente di imparare, di conoscere. No? Solo qui vale la pena di vivere. Socrate si trova addirittura a disagio perché l'amico lo ha portato pochi passi fuori dalla città, in un luogo naturale, peraltro bellissimo. E il significato sembra chiaro. Eh, la razionalità critica di Socrate, fondata sul dialogo, sull'arte del pensare libero, del domandare, si identifica con una città che nega la natura. L'essere umano, sembra di capire, per conoscere se stesso può diventare un buon cittadino e quindi forse raggiungere la felicità solo in quanto si disinteressa della campagna, degli alberi, della natura. Platone del resto associa spesso nei suoi dialoghi le zone rurali, la natura all'ignoranza. La campagna è un po' il luogo simbolico in cui il padre della nostra filosofia colloca i falsi sapienti, quelli che ancora non hanno capito che l'unica via verso la conoscenza e la felicità è fatta solo di dialogo con i concittadini. E gli alberi e le piante, lo capite, non servono a questo scopo. È una novità straordinaria quella contenuta in queste parole di Socrate, anche rivoluzionaria per la Grecia stessa, per la cultura greca, per i filosofi greci presocratici, ma poi anche dopo, per Aristotele, per i filosofi successivi. E gli eventi naturali non sono affatto indegni di conoscenza, anzi. Sono raccolti sotto una parola bellissima ed enigmatica, che in greco è physis, che noi imperfettamente traduciamo con natura. Anzi, i fenomeni naturali sono gli oggetti di studio più nobile, più importante. Physis, infatti, per la tradizione greca non è solo una distesa silente o irrilevante di piante e animali, è lo, lo sgorgare dell'essere, il manifestarsi dell'ordine cosmico. Ed è adesso che l'uomo deve guardare, con la massima attenzione perché ne fa parte, è Physis egli stesso, anzi deve imitarlo l'ordine della natura, anche nella città. La parola fondamentale per capire la Grecia classica è mimesis, imitazione, e mimesis fa da contraltare alla physis ciò che va imitato, la natura. Per questo dunque quel passo del Fedro, quelle parole di Socrate sono una rottura, inaugurano, o almeno così sembra, una radicale rivoluzione tra l'uomo e la natura, tra l'umano e il non umano. E questa rottura ci sembra anche l'inizio di una lunga tradizione di è una tendenza fondamentale della nostra civiltà, della storia d'Occidente, cioè l'antropocentrismo, l'uomo al centro. Da allora in avanti, e ancora di più nei secoli a venire, con l'avvento del cristianesimo, in cui annuncio, colloca l'uomo al centro del creato, l'essere umano si erge sulla natura come superiore, in quanto unico tra le creature, è plasmato a immagine e somiglianza di Dio. E poi l'età moderna, che secolarizza il messaggio cristiano, non fa che radicalizzare l'antropocentismo antico, riducendo la, la, la natura a materia inerte, a un vero e proprio terreno di conquista per la scienza e per la tecnica. 
Ciò che non è umano, dice per esempio un filosofo del Novecento, Martin Heidegger, giace come un fondo a disposizione della tecnica, che trasforma e manipola la natura per soddisfare i bisogni dell'uomo, che è ormai l'unico signore del cosmo. Beh, questo è lo scenario dentro cui si è prodotto l'impetuoso sviluppo scientifico e tecnologico che ha prodotto risultati straordinari ha consentito in meno di un secolo di, ad esempio di raddoppiare l'aspettativa di vita per gran parte dell'umanità di migliorare la qualità dell'esistenza dentro e fuori i confini dell'Occidente risultati magnifici che però hanno un costo elevato elevatissimo alcuni li abbiamo appena visti tra i primi a segnalare questo costo all'opinione pubblica mondiale furono i ricercatori dell'MIT autori del celebre rapporto The Limits to Growth i limiti dello sviluppo pubblicato quasi 50 anni fa, nel 72, furono attaccati da destra e da sinistra, dai fautori del progresso industriale e di stampo liberale, liberista e anche da quelli di scuola marxista, tutti ancora legati in modo molto acritico a un'idea di crescita senza limiti. Oggi, quasi mezzo secolo dopo la pubblicazione, noi conosciamo molto meglio i, i pericoli connessi a una crescita illimitata, proprio grazie alla scienza, che non è solo motore del progresso industriale, ma come abbiamo appena visto, è sua istanza critica, in grado di analizzarne e prevederne gli effetti devastanti. Ad esempio, secondo uno studio del 2015, nel mondo sono morte di inquinamento 5 milioni e mezzo di persone, 659 mila morti in un anno nella sola Unione Europea. Ma noi a questo non pensiamo, ne soffriamo quando tocca a noi o a chi amiamo, forse ci indigniamo quando raramente ne parlano i media, e tuttavia non riusciamo a trasformare questa debole consapevolezza in un motore per il cambiamento della nostra vita, della nostra visione del mondo, dei nostri comportamenti quotidiani. Siamo colpiti dal successo dell'iniziativa di una mobilitazione come il Global Strike for Future, del, di avviata da una ragazzina svedese, Greta Thunberg, che mostra quanto la paura di un futuro insostenibile possa mobilitare i più giovani. E guardiamo con curiosità al consenso che cresce intorno ai partiti ecologisti, in Germania, in Austria, in Olanda, spesso sottraendo anche voti ai partiti di destra, ai partiti conservatori, oppure al Green New Deal negli Stati Uniti. Ma poi ci fermiamo lì, non andiamo oltre, non ci riusciamo. E perché? La mia risposta a questa domanda è perché per noi la natura è ancora, soprattutto, un, come lo chiamava Heidegger, un fondo a disposizione, una cassetta degli attrezzi da usare senza badare al loro logorio. Il discorso pubblico This is... Switch off. This Let me try this one. Il discorso pubblico è cambiato, certo, e perfino i numeri uno del capitalismo globale hanno invitato e accolto Greta alla World Economic Forum di Davos, per esempio. E forse nessuno di noi oggi si azzarderebbe a dire, come disse Socrate, eh, gli alberi, le piante, la campagna non mi insegnano niente. Anzi, da quando viviamo raccolti nelle città, sempre più lontani dal verde della vegetazione, ormai la popolazione urbana nel mondo ha superato quella delle zone rurali, c'è una nostalgia di ispirazione anche un po' romantica che ci spinge ad amare la natura incontaminata come un luogo di rifugio, di purificazione no? dai ritmi pressanti della vita in città, un tempo libero dalle incombenze del lavoro, addirittura in alcuni casi come via di fuga definitiva dallo stress metropolitano. E sono mutamenti visibili, certo, ma sono ancora superficiali. La sostanza del problema non cambia. Anche quando acquistiamo cibo biologico, facciamo la raccolta differenziata dei rifiuti, oppure quando capiamo finalmente, anche grazie a scienziati come, eh, come chi mi sta seduto a fianco, che il cambiamento climatico in atto è anche causato dall'uomo, anche in questi casi virtuosi rimane tuttavia in noi l'idea di uno stacco netto di una separazione ontologica, direbbero i filosofi, tra quello che noi siamo e la natura, tra il nostro mondo e il mondo esterno. Polis e Fisis per noi sono ancora due domini differenti, regioni dell'essere fatte proprio, fatte di sostanze diverse. 
e finché questa nostra convinzione non sarà affrontata e decostruita alle sue radici, poco si potrà fare e ogni gesto a favore dell'ambiente resterà un tentativo nobile di andare contro corrente. Bisogna invece cambiare paradigma, ci vuole un cambio di rotta che non deve arrivare dall'alto, dai politici o dalle elite intellettuali o dal potere economico, deve avvenire dentro ciascuno di noi. Un aiuto per prepararci a questo cambio di rotta, ecco la mia proposta in conclusione, diciamo, lo possiamo ritrovare, e sembra un paradosso, proprio in Socrate. Sì, proprio lui, lo stesso personaggio che poco fa ho indicato come il primo colpevole, Socrate il naturicida, no? l'iniziatore di quell'antropocentrismo che minaccia di distruggere il nostro pianeta. Le sue parole così anti-ecologiche sugli alberi e la campagna, che per noi suonano quasi fastidiose, vanno comprese meglio. Polis, per lui infatti, la città, non è banalmente il luogo fisico, quello fatto di case, di piazze, di strade affollate, di teatri, di palestre. Polis è l'orizzonte di vita, l'orizzonte esistenziale dentro cui un essere umano esce dall'isolamento. Approda cioè alla polis, dal punto di vista di Socrate, chi si lascia alle spalle l'egoismo che cerca solo la massima soddisfazione dei propri desideri e soffre la presenza degli altri, le regole, la giustizia come se fossero degli impedimenti, dei mali necessari. Polis è cioè il modo di vivere di chi abbatte il muro che lo separa dagli altri ma anche da se stesso, dalla sua natura relazionale, politica. Quindi la campagna, anche in quei passi di Platone che vi ho citato, non è che il simbolo, cioè l'immagine scritta dell'assenza di relazione, dell'individualismo più radicale. È, è il luogo simbolico di chi vive eh, in modo appunto impolitico, relegando i rapporti con gli altri in una dimensione apparente, superficiale, nascondendosi magari dietro maschere o ruoli sociali che oscurano il vero volto. Molte nostre città, allora, da questo punto di vista, anche se sono soffocate dal cemento e dall'asfalto, sono anch'esse, in questo senso, delle zone rurali che ci destinano a una vita segnata dalla solitudine, anche quando questa vita ci sembra affollata da sin troppe presenze umane. Infatti la vita in città oggi si delinea spesso come un'esperienza di solitudine condivisa. Polis, al contrario, significa il superamento delle barriere che costituiscono, al tempo di Socrate, esattamente come al nostro, le radici della nostra infelicità. Ma allora, se questa mia lettura è giusta, Polis non è davvero il luogo che nega la natura e l'ambiente. Non è un posto delimitato da mura di cinta che la separano della campagna bensì al contrario alla polis si accede soltanto superando i muri, superando sia i muri che dividono e allontanano i cittadini tra loro, sia il muro che divide ciascuno di noi all'interno, tra una dimensione interiore e i ruoli sociali che ricopriamo. Ecco dunque la sorpresa che sembra dunque contraddire le parole iniziali di disprezzo verso la natura, verso la campagna, gli alberi. La polis, intesa così, cioè non come una definita area urbana, ma come l'orizzonte dell'esistenza in cui possiamo finalmente essere quello che siamo, non si contrappone affatto alla natura. Al contrario, la polis incarnata proprio dalla figura di Socrate, che è l'uomo che vive sempre immerso nella relazione con i concittadini, senza mai sottrarsi, senza mai tenere nulla in salvo, anche dal pericolo di queste relazioni. Questa polis così travolgente e complessa da capire è la massima espressione della fisis. La polis è quanto di più naturale ci sia e quindi superare il muro che, che ci spezza in due interiormente, che separa i nostri desideri più intimi dai volti superficiali che offriamo allo sguardo degli altri e superare il muro che divide i cittadini tra loro anche e poi i singoli dalla società, dalle istituzioni. Questo doppio superamento consente anche, finalmente, di lasciarsi alle spalle l'altro ingannevole muro, quello prodotto dall'antropocentrismo. 
figlio ad un tempo del cristianesimo e anche di un certo progresso scientifico e tecnologico dell'età moderna. Cioè il muro antropocentrico eretto tra l'uomo e invece un'altra sfera dell'essere non umana, depotenziata, svilita, no? ridotta appunto a un fondo a disposizione. Certo, i muri che ho indicato sembrano molto diversi e sembrano avere a che fare con cose molto diverse tra di loro. E tuttavia proprio lo studio attento della figura di Socrate ci fa capire, ecco l'aiuto che ci offre, che in verità essi sono modi di esprimere lo stesso muro, la stessa separazione. È difficile da capire questa identità di cose diverse e tuttavia si tratta di un passaggio decisivo a mio modo di vedere. La comprensione di questo messaggio quasi paradossale, che è incarnato dalla scandalosa per certi aspetti figura di Socrate, è la porta stretta attraverso cui dobbiamo passare per conquistare, nello stesso tempo e con lo stesso gesto, il contatto con noi stessi, con gli altri umani e con l'orizzonte naturale di cui siamo parte. Quindi il superamento della menzogna che separa l'uomo dalla natura, questa menzogna è come un'ombra ingannevole proiettata sul fondo di una caverna, direbbe Platone. E questo è il nostro compito, è un processo naturale e politico insieme che ci può oggi avvicinare addirittura alla felicità, categoria greca fondamentale, in una tensione comune che deve mettere al centro la salvezza del nostro pianeta. Grazie. That's a very energetic response to a very complicated statement. <laughs> Um, and it leads me to the question that was sort of formulating in my mind as I was listening, which is, uh, if you look at the news reporting on the situation, for example, the extinction of up to a million species, uh, nothing but pessimism would seem to ensue. Uh, and I ask maybe how artists make art in a context where the, uh, the logical outcome, so to speak, or the predictable outcome, the scientifically foreseen outcome, is mostly pretty dire. Um, how do you make utopian art in a dystopian situation, if I want to call it that? Because I think to make art generally requires a certain kind of faith that the thing you make will last, that it will last for the benefit of others, and that it will last, uh, that, that the others will last as well. So maybe you can take that. Yeah. So uh, for me personally, I turn to humor. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I actually, you know, we need philosophers in this discussion. Philosophy is really important, I think, and science is also exceptionally important. Um, but we turn to philosophers typically when we don't know the right questions to ask. So, of course, me coming into this, I've been observing this whole Anthropocene thing in Asia for, for uh, two decades, and I, didn't, I still didn't know the right questions I needed to be asking. So I started engaging with philosophy, mostly with, uh, originally with Timothy Morton, the eco-philosopher. And one of the things that I found that was very captivating with, with Timothy Morton's work was that he was able to engage people with humor. And that humor really gave a certain amount of levity and it allowed people to really engage, I mean, engage with the ideas. And at the end of the day, I mean, you know, you heard my little activistic rant, I guess, when I first started, uh, my first little, little passage. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we really need to broadly raise the public consciousness uh, as artists, I, I feel, like this is my opinion. Um, and the only way to do that is to make work that's very accessible. And so for me, I found one of the ways to, to make something that's so, you know, this, this grave kind of existential, uh, these grave existential issues, was to turn to humor in, in, in the works. So uh, the work I have here in, in the show, we took the Exxon logo, and then we, so we separated the E and the X, and the O and the M, and we put extinction, we turned into the spelling the word extinction out. And then every uh, seven minutes and 20 seconds, the, the work activates. And that activation signifies that an extinction event has taken place somewhere on the planet. And we're using the average, so around 200 species a day are going extinct. So here that works out to, that works out to seven minutes and 20 seconds, so that causes the activation. Um, so you, if you're in the room, you will connect with this thing that we are all 
all of us here are completely disconnected from. You know, if you're not an Inuit, if you're not a winemaker, if you're not a farmer, if you're not on the front lines of climate change and, and this changing planet that we live in, um, you have no access to these things. So I'm trying to make these things a bit more accessible um, you know, through, through the work that we make. I think it's a really interesting question about, uh, about how, what are we going to do? And what are we going to do as artists? Um, I think we're going to need to do away with all kinds of borders, for number one. I think there's no longer any way to rationally uh, have countries. Um, we're all in this together at this point. We're going to have to redefine the logistics of daily life around the watershed. And we're going to have to stop relying on elected people and bureaucrats to manage these things. So the time has come in the history of the world to rethink um, the daily and to take back the infrastructure that um, is currently being um, not really, uh, it's not really working for all living systems. In specific, very little of what we use um, in, by the way of power, by the way of extractive industry, is connected to any feedback loop from Mother Nature. So as artists, we now have to think for everything we make, how do we, how do we give back? What is the feedback loop for all the materials that we source? What is the feedback loop for the lagoon of the Biennale? What is the feedback loop um, when we lay down um, our lives back into the ground. It's often something I think about that everything that we've ever touched, every piece of clothes, every watch, every earring that anybody's ever had is somewhere on the planet. So everything um, belongs to all of us, but somehow we've been marginalizing our potential action and hoping that other people will carry it through. So I think that artists by nature are relatively free if we um, live in a country that won't imprison us or beat us for speaking truth to power. Um, our practices have to be in direct service to Mother Earth at this point, and we owe a major debt of, to all living systems, and our role as artists needs to be to mitigate the entropy that's created by our um, living patterns. Uh, well, I think that, um, as I said um, at the end of my presentation, uh, according to what uh, we know from a scientific point of view or from a rational point of view, what we can say is that uh, uh, the future depends on us, and uh, the, uh, at least the, the, the future, the, the climate of, uh, of our planet and the future depend on uh, our choices today. And um, in particular, um, climate change is already going on, so we cannot stop it, we cannot uh, um, avoid it. But now we can decide if it will be below a certain threshold or if it will be above a certain threshold. And these thresholds have strong implications uh, uh, for our, our life, for our society. So a future where, <clears throat> at the end of this century, the global warming will be five degrees or more uh, is uh, something that experts define as unknown, which means that we actually don't know what can happen, or probably also um, survival of our society as, as we know it uh, uh, is in danger probably so um, and um, so now we have to decide what kind of, uh, of uh, future um, we will have and probably not we but uh, our, our um, child, our, our sons and uh, our grandsons, uh, our gra grandchildren and, um, and um, and so now, now uh, we have to decide, and in order to decide, we, we need to make a change of paradigm of, uh, um, um, of uh, what we think, uh, what we believe uh, should be our, 
social development, economical development. So uh, this uh, uh, requires uh, the engagement uh, of uh, um, everyone. I mean, everyone has to rethink about uh, uh, what, uh, um, what, uh, what, our, what, what are our choices uh, and uh, what should be our growth, uh, what should be our values. And, uh, and so this is uh, a matter of, uh, um, of engagement of uh, everyone in order to rethink uh, what uh, is uh, really important for, for our life. Uh, as far as uh, what artists can do, uh, I mean, I know that you, you can't ask artists to, 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 to spread the message, your heart does much more than that. But uh, what I try to say with, with my speech, and I do apologize again for the non Italian speaking here, I hope you all manage to catch at least the main sense of what I try to say, is that we can have artists, intellectuals, uh, journalists, whatever, we can at least help people to, to get aware of the fact that what we need is not just to change our attitude towards uh, water, natural elements, uh, or, uh, but at the same time we have to change our perspective on ourselves, on our relation with the others, with the people we live with in, in our city or with the foreign people coming from other countries. We, we, uh, we need to change a paradigm which is not just a, a mere change of our attitude towards some parts of our life. What we are requested for is a total change of paradigm. It's changing and behaving in a more sustainable way means uh, approaching our excessive individualism and its consequences. This is what we can work on and probably also artists, if they want, if, if they like, if they agree, can work about it. This is my humble opinion. Thank you. something. I mean, basically all of this comes down to the crisis of the nation state as a unit of political organization, right? But you can't wish away the nation state, and as we've seen in recent anti-immigrant sentiments and so on and so forth, the more threatened that nation state becomes, the more violent certain elements of it are. Yeah. But gradually, and we don't have much time, you can change the consciousness of what that unit is. And I'm reminded of the work of Fernand Baudel, who was a French historian, who did a history of the Mediterranean, not a history of France, not a history of Italy, Spain, whatever it is, but the history of the Mediterranean, which was not exactly an ecosystem in the way he approached it, but it was connected to all the different layers of cultural and natural phenomena that defined that region. And is it perhaps not now the beginning, uh, the period where we can speak more generally in those terms of regions and systems and, and other organizational elements of the ecologies of societies and of the social growth, language growth, and so on, and to suspend the conversation about the nation state briefly so we can learn something we don't know. Um, my teacher, who will be speaking tomorrow, Newton Harrison, via uh, satellite, would talk about what's needed is for us to embrace the five great commons. And the last one that you're discussing um, is the commons of our collective stories. And the Mediterranean really is the home of those stories. But in addition to that, this idea that we all breathe air, uh, we all need topsoil, uh, we all need oceans um, to survive. Kelly, what am I forgetting? The forests. Um, the great commons are the responsibility of, of all of us to embrace and to um, define, and I would add to that within the collect collective of our commons, I think it's up to us artists to reestablish a non-hierarchical um, hive mind where we step out of the myth of originality in contemporary art and embrace the collective idea that art practice is a unified field. Um, I think that that's really critical and to look beyond capitalism 
as the ultimate objective of art and perhaps even let go of the idea of a collection as a permanent um, thing in favor of the idea of production of the paradigm shift being the primary purpose of art practice. Just one example of how artists could respond to the manner within their practices that I'm talking about. Um, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, David Hammonds and Yanis Kunadis were at the American Academy in Rome. Each did their own piece. David's piece was done with a series of African masks uh, that sort of stacked one upon the other, and from the mouth of one of them issued sand. Now, whether this is exactly true or not, David said that that sand was the sand of the Sahara that had blown across the Mediterranean during the storm season of whatever, I don't know, spring. Um, and to create a metaphor for the fact that we are already, in fact, connected to the Sahara, it's not just people that come from the Sahara, it's everything. <laughs> and everything goes back. Mm -hmm. And so maybe, maybe artists can begin to think along the lines of what systems they can intervene in that are natural, what cycles, what... Uh, things that don't declare nationality in scary ways that simply say, these are part of our environment already. Can I just add that what you just said about nationalism is really crucial, because if you look at the political European scene now, we, we see two main and strong uh, forces opposing to each other. One is what we call nationalism or populism or whatever, and the other one is just the ecological, ecologist movement, which is not organized, it's just something very uh, disarticulated at the moment, but we all hope that it will become a real political subject in the future. These are the two most attractive perspectives facing one and the other. And uh, it, is, it is actually basic. Mare Nostrum, which is the title of this event, uh, as you likely know, is not just the Latin name of the Mediterranean, but it was also the name of an important humanitarian operation led by the Italian Navy five years ago, that for us means ages ago, mm -hmm. when we still had a rational and uh, government, let's say, uh, aimed to save life in, in the Mediterranean, something that we don't have anymore. It's, it really belonged to our past. And uh, we definitely need to, 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 to at the same time, to, to go towards the, the, the uh, non-nationalistic perspective, which means immediately a different approach to the natural element and to our Mediterranean first. This is like, goes together necessarily. It's uh, very interesting, I think. From a scientific point of view, what would you look to artists to bring? Uh, yeah, and I, I was thinking about it, and, and now I try to formulate my thought. And, uh, <clears throat> um, as I said before, um, this problem is uh, the climate problem is uh, um, strongly linked to scales, to dimension of the problem. And uh, in particular, the problem, the climate change problem, as we see now. And is created by the scales of human activities, who started to be so large to, uh, to interfere with the, with the physical properties of our planet. And so in order to, um, to avoid what I was saying before, so this catastrophic future where we will have a global warming of five degrees or so, in order to avoid it, we need to put in place uh, policies, not from tomorrow, from today, or maybe from yesterday. We need to, to put in place policies which have the same scales than those that uh, we have uh, put in place in the past in order to produce this problem. Mm -hmm. And in order to do so, we need to engage, as I was saying before, we need to engage basically everyone, because we need to, um, um, to, 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 to make sure that everyone is committed to this, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to take on this problem. Uh, now, as scientists, we clearly failed in, uh, in engaging people and, uh, uh, for example, uh, policy makers, because, I mean, they are the case that we are talking about this problem, but, I mean, things are continuous, 
uh, going as, uh, as it has been um, in the past uh, and uh, with no uh, evident changes. And, uh, and so uh, probably, I was thinking that probably what we should try to do, in particular artists should try to do, is to, to change our communication. As scientists we, cannot, we, we are not able to communicate the problem and so we are even not able to communicate the solutions. Probably artists should try to change this communication, making it more emotional, trying to, to engage people from a more emotional point of view and trying to, to translate it in some other language that probably could be more effective in producing some uh, change uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, what, uh, how we are developing uh, uh, how we are treating our planet. And, and, and sometimes those worlds can meet. I mean, you know, C.P. Snow, the British philosopher and writer, uh, talked about the two cultures, but the two cultures, the science and the humanities, are not antithetical. Meet, should not be in. Anyway, uh, Rachel Carson, who wrote one of the first ecological books in the English language, called it, by a simple phrase, which is exactly what's necessary, the silent spring. And you think about that, what's the silent spring? A silent spring is no birds, no sounds, no animals. And if there were more phrases that could sort of characterize what we're headed towards, then there might, and also images as well, then there might be a, a raised consciousness about it. Now, that title has become a cliche, so nobody responds to it anymore. So there constantly needs to be new versions of such simple statements. And I guess that's up to the rest of us to do, right? <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's, that's exactly what I've been trying to do. You see it on my shirt here. We, we are the asteroid. The, the, uh... Could we go to the, the image uh, from uh, So uh, just to, uh, last week, this show, my show closed, it was in, uh, in London. And I was working with, uh, I worked with the philosopher Bruno Latour, who used some of Bruno's text. We worked with Timothy Morton, uh, Greta Thunbayou, who you mentioned, the 16-year-old climate activist. Um, one of the things that I started realizing is that these issues, because of the scale, cannot be solved at a personal individual level. You can all go home tonight and you can separate your Coke cans and your plastic bottles. I mean, it's, these, these things are, these are morally and statistically insignificant. Nobody in here alone can solve these issues. And I would beg to say that as an artist, we can't, there's no individual artist that can sit here and, and solve these issues. And so one of the things I started realizing is that we needed a more collective kind of consciousness. We needed a more collective uh, way of thinking about and addressing these issues. You know, these issues cannot, you know, they have to be uh, solved on a supranational level. We have to get people into power actually care about these issues. We need these, the government, the governments have to write laws that, 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 that essentially allow us to create the change that we had. It's not gonna happen on the individual level. So one of the things I was trying, was trying to do was take some of these ideas, take some of this text, we are the asteroid. Timothy Morton, can you go to the next image? Um, we did this all across New York City where I read these large highway message boards were solar powered and we would put different eco aphorisms on them and they would flash as people would walk by and of course they'd see them and they'd have a limiting response to them because usually the government is putting messages on these boards. And you can go to the next image. Uh, that's one that's in Colorado right now that's heading out to Los Angeles. Uh, go to the next one. Uh, that was on the Chicago Navy Pier for a while. Um, I, can't, I can't quite read these, but uh, they have different aphorisms on them. I think that one is danger, anthropocentrism. Uh, they said we are, there is no way so these are different ways that I was trying, because I also was paying attention to you know, like Rachel Carson, how she summed it up. Um, and, then, and then artists like Jenny Holzer was able to take all these aphorisms and make these incredibly pithy statements that people just, you could get it, you could access it, and make these very important uh, scientific ideas, philosophical ideas. Uh, you know, so for some reason, we're working with writers, poets, thinkers, philosophers, people that had, that were on the front lines, activists, that were on the front lines, and uh, try to make this, again, just make it accessible, so. Can I have one more thing? Please, please, please. Um, I just wanted to take the 
opposite perspective a second and just say that I totally believe that individuals can solve this problem and that art practice absolutely can take individual uh, uh, range of opportunity and manifest real physical change in, in the world and that we actually have to do that and that we actually have to think beyond metaphor, beyond language and move into actually activating the paradigm shift ourselves and influencing ourselves in a non-hierarchical, non-hope for the best, there's going to be a better political leader next time kind of way. It's time to do that work. There hasn't been a moment before where we can directly look into art history and say, oh, like they did it, but that's what we have to do. Now, in my, in my own practice, what that's involved is a seven-year infrastructural monument called Bending the River Back into the City. It's involved 66 federal, state, and local permits, um, and will be an entirely invisible art object. So I've had to slowly let go of every single aesthetic um, choice for that project in order to get a water right for a hundred acre feet of wastewater river to redirect to a hundred acres of public space in order to um, create shade, lower climate. Um, I know it's possible and it takes a long time and it means perhaps giving up the fact that there'll be no photographers who can make that image to show anybody what the work is about. But at the same time, I was able to get the first water right in the city of Los Angeles that's private as an artwork because I was able to check the box other. It wasn't a development project and nobody else wanted to take the liability for the work. Um, I've been able to leverage that water right into water rights for the Paiute Indians in the Owens Valley where their water comes from. I've been able to hold conferences with the Paiute and ask them what they would want for their water and they said they would want a real going economic opportunity like to take back the hot springs and teach traditional native children how to um, take care of water. So that's one person doing one artwork over the last seven or eight years that's probably still another seven or eight years away from being fully realizable but it is possible to step out of metaphoric thinking and into action, and it's, uh, it's required at this point. I'm watching our time a little bit, and this is what moderators are supposed to do, and direct traffic, so perhaps it's time for people in the house to ask questions or make comments. May the comments be of limited length, okay? There are only five panelists, so don't recruit yourself to be the sixth. Um, but anyway, uh, if, if anybody wants to uh, uh, say something or uh, go deeper with something that has been said here, uh, we have Mike, we can, I can hand it down, um, so just come forward. which we kind of hide from the uh, external, from the social context we live in. And we tend to offer to people we live with just a, a small piece of ourselves. So uh, I think this is one of the, the main reasons for what we nowadays call uh, psychological disease or unhappiness, if you like, unsatisfaction uh, and, and loneliness as well. And so, as far as I am concerned, what I, what I try to do every day is to, to 
to do some to do things in my work or in my social life or in the, whatever I'm doing, which tend to to, to reflect what I am uh, at most. And of course, there will always be a, a, a gap between what I have inside and what I manage to do to, to show outside to 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 the, to the others. But I think this is the, uh, well, I, I, I should justify this, but I would need many hours, and probably I should speak in Italian to do it more efficiently like that. Uh, what, what I think we have to work on, because it's one of the main factors to explain our the sense of unsatisfaction is, is working on this enormous gap between what we have inside and what we should show outside. Uh, my first concern has to do with uh, the, 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 the way we work, the relationship we develop with our jobs, young workers in specific. Uh, and this is something I became aware doing my everyday job because I work as a journalist at the radio, at the national, Italian national radio. And many times, often I talk about we talk about uh, about work and employment and the difficult relationship that young people have with their own job. And what they they, they complain about is not just a low salary or bad contracts, but also that they they miss the possibility of and this is getting worse every day, the possibility of expressing what they are when they work every day, day after day, as if the job market were, was, uh, were uh, developing in a direction which does not allow this uh, continuous contact with ourselves, this continuous need that we have to express ourselves when we do something. This is something that I, I was not aware of about uh, enough until I managed to, 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 to listen to a lot of personal experiences of people who, who say, this is my main problem, besides the economic problem. So when I talk about interior rule of division, I mainly think about this, I hope I managed to be at least uh, in part. Yes. Uh, Louis, you could turn back to the artist's need to create. Um, so full disclaimer, I, I, I do work in a collective with Warren, so um, I'm in a kind of a long dialogue for the last 10 years with her about um, but, you know, hearing the panel and the discussion today and looking at this mission statement, uh, it made me start to think about a particular point that I hadn't really considered before, that there's this sort of dichotomy posited here between creation and destruction. That seems to be the main tension in this statement. And I just started thinking about what if we reverse these two, uh, these two values and say that artists need to destroy on the same scale that society has the capacity to create. And I, I just think that, in other words, creation uh, always, uh, creation of one thing in a closed system always needs the destruction of another. I, I think this relates in, in Warren's work. I know that she, there's a concept of metabolic and catabolic process. Um, and so, and, and compost and sort of um, the, 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 the kinds of systems that happen in any living system. I guess I just wanted to toss that back to the, the group and, and think about, in a way, um, yeah, that tension between creation and destruction. And maybe also in a scientific uh, yeah. context as well. Obviously, this touches on the laws of thermodynamics and that for everything alive, heat is produced. And um, the heat that's produced, de depending on extractive industries and other industrial processes, is creating a heat that we can't control. So the question is, um, in this catabolic 
entropy that we're living in? What can we do to mitigate this? So, you know, I, I would love to hear from the scientists as well about this. What, what I've chosen to do with, with my practice at Metabolic Studio is to try and intervene um, in the catabolic um, entropic cycle with things like the creation of topsoil, um, the um, cleansing of wastewater, the, distribu the distribution of a cleansed wastewater river through a post-capitalist citizens' utility as a social practice art project um, in order to shift the paradigm and show how this could be modeled at a larger scale. Um, but the question, I think, is it, of, of how destruction and creation are twins of everything that's uh, around and will always be around is, is, um, is I think, something that would be wonderful to hear from scientists about as well. Uh, well, uh, I think I should think about this for one month <laughs> to give a proper um, answer. Um, I really, I really feel uncomfortable because I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not ready to this kind of um, um, discussion and this kind of thinking. I, I'm sorry because I, I think that this is my a limitation of mine. I mean, I usually use different paradigm. I don't, uh, I don't think in this. Uh, I even don't really understand what does it mean. I mean, I understand what it, um, I think I understand already. I have uh, um, my interpretation of this uh, statement. Um, I, I'm really, uh, I'm really not sure I can understand uh, if I have an interpretation of, uh, of the opposite. I mean, if we change destruction and, uh, and destruction and, and uh, creation. I, 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 I'm sorry because I, uh, I know that in this way I'm not giving a, a, a contribution to this discussion and it's, uh, I really um, feel bad about that. Uh, but um, but um, that's not my cup of tea, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, I have to say that the, the activist response that you give makes perfect sense to me. But not all artists are good at activism, and there are other ways in which they respond. Poetry is actually one of those responses, and I would say, to take an example of visual poetry, uh, Elan Atsui, who is the uh, Ghanaian artist, the Nigerian artist living in Ghana, who's been in several Biennales, has for mm, over a decade now made these magnificent curtains out of the collar wrappers of alcohol bottles sold in this country. Uh, and to take the recycling of something which is basically a social poison in this context and to make of it something magnificent and then to make uh, metaphors beyond just that activity because the, each one of his, his uh, curtains has a different thrust to it is one way in which one can take what is essentially a negative thing and turn it inside out. It's, 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 it's a kind of poetic alchemy. It doesn't solve the problem of resources in Africa. It doesn't actually dent the garbage situation much either, but it begins to make people think along the lines of what could be done as opposed to uh, thinking that the only thing is one political action or no action at all. Okay, sorry, I killed the conversation. <laughs> Is there anybody else out there who'd like to chime in or challenge? Yeah. I just want to make a quick comment and thank you all for creating this space for this kind of alchemy to occur because I really, truly believe in my heart that we need to engage both the emotional and the rational centers of society for survival at this point. And it's not easy for scientists and artists to speak to each other. And I actually studied the sciences and then moved into the arts, so I have both parts of my mind engaged. And I often think about how can we create a new language so that we can empower each other more? Because we need each other right now. It's, it's crisis levels. So I just want to I want to say thank you to Paul and Francesca for. Creating
creating these kinds of spaces in the most famous you know, art show in the world <laughs> to have this simple conversation is so inspiring to me. So just a comment on, on that. Well, I would like to second that loudly. Uh, I have a comment as well. I thought it was absolutely extraordinary that you as a scientist uh, gave us permission as artists to be emotional and that you feel as a scientist that what is, no, seriously, that what is needed is the, the emotional counterpart. So I really want to thank you for that. And to the philosopher, uh, I was extremely moved by what you said about what's needed is to that gap. I think I think it's in all of us, the gap of what exists within us that we know in our souls and how to express it, how to become, how to participate in, through, through our expression to, to the entire society. And to, for, for you to, to, to talk about that, it is a very personal and yet it is global, right? It is who we are. We, there is a second, and that is what's needed right now. And it's, um, I just find this extremely inspiring panel, and I just want to thank you. And also, the, uh, in terms of science and, and destruction and creation, I mean, we come from the destruction of stars. We come from the explosion of supernova. Everything exists from destruction, from violence. So, here we are. <laughs> The grand synthesis that's required for life itself is embodied in a space like the one we're in that has stood for hundreds of years and uh, is here for all of us to be able to come together in this kind of sacred space, this kind of sacred cave of a space and to imagine that beyond our words and beyond our intellect and built beyond our even our breath itself is our wish to be of service to life itself and to be part of this you know great curve of being which is the root um, of spirit of spirit and um, that's certainly I think why there's no real dichotomy between science and art. As, as Alfred Jarry said a hundred years ago, it all comes from the known into the unknown. Pataphysics, or the science of the absurd, is to move from the known into the unknown. And that's the moment we're again collectively standing on. One world gone, the world that we've been living in, and another yet to be born. And together, we're all puzzling through it with prayer. And whether it's art or science, we're figuring, we're actively figuring out um, how to be translators of the spiritual energy. I, I can only answer that the, the, the philosophical effort I tried to talk about is not just a, a rational one, an intellectual one, uh, separated by, uh, from, from our emotions or from our irrational side. It's something that has to do with the uh, human being as, as, a, as a whole. So, uh, of course, it, it, it is made of uh, thinking, emotions, desires, and uh, spiritual energy, if, even if uh, it, it has nothing to do with religion, as far as I'm concerned, because it's uh, uh, the perspective I, uh, I adopt is another one, it's different, but 
in this sense, uh, it depends on what we mean on spiritual energy or sp the spiritual dimension, of course, but uh, I must say that the, the, the philosophy I was trying to transmit to you by my speeches has totally to do with emotions, desire, and also what we probably call spiritual, no, not separation. Not, not, otherwise, it would, be, it would pose a new gap between the rational and the spiritual, mm -hmm. which could be uh, a failure, a total failure. Okay, are we, yes, one more. A key. A key. No, coming from your background, how do you live this separation that was mentioned earlier between arts and science in our, in our tradition philosophy? This was it, an issue and not an issue. It's a great issue and it's a great problem for, for Italy, of course. And this is probably the reason why, uh, it, if you look at the international statistics, you find out that Italians are less scientific. <laughs> now, maybe you can confirm, I don't know, how, how your students are doing last time. But uh, this is a huge problem that, that we need to face. Of course, artists and scientists do a different job, and probably uh, in the middle, uh, intellectual and maybe philosopher can, can help both <laughs> to, to, keep in, to, to stay in relations. And this is what I can answer to you. But of course, this is a huge problem, because it belongs to the same uh, separating perspective I was talking about in my speech. Whereas science uh, is on the side of uh, the, uh, the human uh, reason and, and, uh, and arts, for some reason, belong to, to the pure, uh, mere irrational dimension. No? So this is something, a prejudice that we, we have not only inherited but also developed during the last. Uh, decades in Italy, if at least. Uh, so this is a problem we need to face, and the separation do it is uh, absolutely un urgent to, 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 to think about. Also because there is no dialogue, at least that our country is concerned, um, between the, the uh, creative dimension and, and science. I don't know if you agree, and if you think that something more could be done. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, well, um, I think that in Italy we have um, extraordinary um, results from the scientific point of view, especially when uh, we consider the little investments that uh, we do, so the, the funding, the very limited funding, and so on and so forth. But if you, if you go to see um, how uh, the international, the, uh, if you go to see the international ranking of uh, scientific, uh, in, in many disciplines of uh, um, the scientific results of Italian centers, they, they, they are uh, really of uh, very, very high level. And uh, so there is this... I didn't mean that we are bad in no, science. No, 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 no. Common I people are very no, no, low no, no. in their... Yes, yes. So there is this... Uh, this um, contradiction between uh, uh, the fact that uh, in Italian culture and in particular um, probably the Italian school systems uh, is able to produce uh, um, uh, a, a good scientific uh, uh, level of thinking from a certain point of view because we have these results in the scientific uh, uh, fields and on the other hand we have this, um, uh, uh, this is my understanding, of, uh, maybe as a philosopher, we have a much clearer vision of it, but we have this uh, uh, quite irrational um, approach to all uh, social problems, to even our political, uh, our political life is uh, usually um, uh, approached with um, irrational, um, attitudes. But now I don't want to enter in a field that is, uh, first of all, it's not my one, so it's just a, a 
number of considerations that are personal, probably personal opinion, but not of interest for the audience. So I don't want to, to, um, to enter in, this, in these aspects. Um, one thing that I, I wanted to, to, to say before to conclude uh, this, uh, this event is that um, I'm, really, I'm really very happy um, to have accepted this invitation and to, to be here but, um, because uh, this, is, this has been probably the most challenging uh, thing for me, the most challenging, that I was completely unprepared to this. Uh, uh, not because, I mean, I've not been a good boy, I didn't do my homework, <laughs> so I, I did all my homework and so on, so on. but uh, this is uh, the kind of, uh, uh, this is very different from what uh, I'm used to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, at a certain point I was also a bit terrified, thinking, oh, well, I have to rush away and I, I have to find a way to escape. <laughs> but uh, um, but then uh, I, I, I'm really I'm really glad because this I think is what we actually need in this kind of uh, uh, interaction of uh, <coughs> of exchange is what uh, we really need and and uh, is also referred to what I was saying before that as scientific community I think we completely. Um, we completely uh, missed our our duty to communicate our results, to communicate our uh, our findings, which are especially these related to climate, so important for the whole society that we really need to to interact with other communities in order to find a way to uh, to to learn to communicate our uh, our stuff. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very glad, and uh, I thank you for, for this event. Well, on that very high note, um, let me thank all the participants, and in particular thank uh, Francesco Pietropano, who is a Venetian, and Fong Boy, who is a Brooklynite, as am I, for having me. I have created this occasion by creating this exhibition, so I would encourage all of you who came for the panel but have not seen the show to stay, look around and see it, and tomorrow there will be a second panel which will be different, I am sure. So, thank you. Okay.